Hi, I'm Rachel Nelson. I'm director of U University of California Santa Cruz Institute of the Arts and Sciences. And with Alexandra Moore, I'm curator of Barring Freedom on view at San Jose Museum of Art. Barring Freedom is a project about art, prisons, policing, and justice. And it really stems from a situation that we see in the United States in which many of us are really well aware of the problems of our prisons and policing. Many of us know, and there's tons of statistics, for instance, about the fact that we have the largest prison population in the world. And a lot of us also know that this has been the case only in the last 40 years, in which our prison population has risen by 500% to over 2 million people. That although that there's this rash of information, statistics and facts, that in some ways we still don't see or perceive what's happening in the country around prisons and policing. And one of the things that in the last few years, there's been more and more artists in the United States who've taken on this problem of perception around prisons and used their artworks to try to think about how people see, how people perceive, how people understand the histories and the presence of prisons. And what we've done in this exhibition is gathered some of those artworks together so that we can explore the ways, range of practices that artists use to think about these problems. For instance, a really good starting place and why we open the exhibition with it is Hank Willis Thomas's If the Leader Only Knew. If you can see, it's like hands that are grasping barbed wire. These hands are completely decontextualized, but they look, for instance, of the hands you would imagine seeing coming out of a prison, coming out of a detention center in the United States. Actually, Hank Willis Thomas took these hands from a photograph from a camp during the Holocaust in Germany. And he's decontextualized them from that horrific history in order to make a larger comment on the systems of incarceration and imprisonment, I think, that have tracked through time. The name If the Leader Only Knew, of course, has incredible resonance because we think about during, for instance, the Holocaust, or now when we think about the Holocaust, we always think, well, did the leadership know? Did the people know? What would we have done in this situation? But of course, in the United States right now, when we think of the 2.3 million people who are held in cages, the, the children that are held in detention centers and the others, but we, in fact, do know that these situations are happening, and the, certainly our leadership does too, but what does it take to, to form a response to the things that are happening around us? When we're thinking about an exhibition think, dealing with the ways that artists respond to how we see and perceive prisons and policing in the United States, I think the first series of works that came to my mind was this series of documentary photographs by Keith Calhoun and Chandra McCormick, photographers from Louisiana. They lived and worked in New Orleans, Louisiana, their entire career, and they've spent over 40 years actually documenting the Louisiana State Penitentiary. The Louisiana State Penitentiary is also known as Angola, and it is one of the most notorious prisons in the world due to its conditions, due to its size. It has one of the biggest prison population in the world. And it's incredibly well known. There's been documentary films about it, all sorts of things. But sometimes I think that people don't really notice the fact that this is a prison called Angola in the United States. And it is, of course, called Angola because it is named after the slave plantation, the plantation that formerly occupied the site the jail now is on. To see the images, or the strikingly beautiful images, of the people made to work in these fields, they look almost as if they could, we could be looking back into history. But as the photographers say, one of the reasons why they so urgently take these photographs and continue to want people to see them is so that people know that this is in fact happening today, right now. This really lovely work is called Edifice and Mortar. And you can see that it is a wall made of bricks. On the bricks are imprinted words from the Declaration of Independence. That document which famously grants us freedom and independence and the rights of citizenship in the United States. But in between the bricks that contain these words on this wall, you can see that the mortar is actually hair. It's hair that Sonia Clark has collected in barber shops, African American barber shops in Richmond, Virginia, to think about what exactly is holding together this concept of independence, the concepts of freedom in the United States. Who has access to them and who doesn't? As you can see with the idea of the wall, this is kind of what are the things that are being built through these systems? 
This work is derived from Sharon Daniels' work with Beverly Henry, who was incarcerated in, this, uh, in the Central California women's facility on and off for most of her adult life. And while she was incarcerated, her job for the California Prison Authority was to sew American flags. In the op-ed that Beverly Henry wrote on the anniversary of Betsy Ross's death, the original seamstress of the American flag, she wrote about the promises of freedom that is imagined to exist within the American flag, the way that it's become an icon for an idea of the nation, and the own obstacles that she'd experienced in order to achieve that, those kind of goals and that kind of equality and freedom that is promised. It was a very powerful piece, and Sharon Daniels said that when she read it, what she thought was that every flag in the United States should be printed with those words. So she approached Beverly and asked her to collaborate with her on this work, which is a filmic work in which Beverly talks about her experiences, queer, black, poor, on drugs, her system being caught within the prison system, and about her relationship to the flag. And as you can see, accompanying the filmic work are two flags that have, in fact, been embroidered with Beverly's powerful words. So Sharon's idea has been realized. This beautiful series of prints is by artist Titus Kafar and poet Reginald Dwayne Betts, who together collaborated to create the Redaction Project. What we see here are portraits of individuals who were caught within the prison systems through their inability to pay court fines. And what the artists and poet have done is look through the files of lawsuits filed on behalf of these individuals and use the, the textual evidence. Reginald Dwayne Betts redacted the words that have rendered these people criminals through these series of, um, of charges and files onto the beautiful portraits of the individuals themselves. This is an audio work by Prison Renaissance, which is an abolitionist organization formed by incarcerated and formerly incarcerated individuals to really push back against the ways in which a prisoner has become a concept that erases people's identities in many ways. This is another work that really thinks about the way that prisons are in policing are a system of identification that narrows people down to crime and punishment. And in response to that, the members of Prison Renaissance ask people who are incarcerated to talk about the ways they see themselves, the roles that they play as writers, artists, musicians, visionaries that have other identities and other works. And in this work, you can hear people talk about the ways in which they see themselves. And here we have Tarball, a powerful work by artist Levester Williams. This is a four-foot ball that's made from unwashed sheets from a Virginia penitentiary and covered then with tar. You can see in the surface of the tar, which is very vicious, there's flies and other debris as well in it. This evokes an, a lot of things that kind of, you can feel the physical presence, I think, of, of the unwashed sheets, of the people who touch those sheets. That's something that the artist was very much interested in. But it also seem, it evokes, for instance, the, the metal balls that people were made to wear around their ankles when they were forced to work on the streets to pave the many roads in the United States. Hi, my name is Alexandra Moore, and I'm one of the co-curators of this exhibition with Rachel Nelson. Here in this room, we have a piece by Maria Gaspar. Maria is a Chicago-based artist, and the work we have on view is this immersive video and sound installation called On the Border of What is Formless and Monstrous. This is a pan of the north wall of the Cook County Jail in Chicago, and as the video pans, you hear sounds from outside and inside the jail. So there's laughter and music from a carnival happening on the street, and there's also snippets of conversation and the slamming and buzzing of doors on the inside. And one of the things this does is it makes the wall seem for a moment permeable. This cell, the drawings and letters going down the side here, and then there's a architectural model behind it. All of these are part of a work called The House That Herman Built by Jackie Summel. And this body of work is the product of a 12-year relationship that um, Jackie 
struck up with Herman Wallace, a man who was kept in solitary confinement in Angola prison for um, over 40 years. Their friendship started when Jackie reached out to Herman and wrote asking, what kind of house does a man who's been kept in a six foot by nine foot box dream of? And in response to that question, Herman wrote to Jackie with details about his life, uh, drawings and imaginings of what kind of house he would love to have, including thinking about what the swimming pool would look like and what kind of books he would love to have in his library and the types of art he might decorate his house with. So together they collectively dreamed up a house and um, you can see that architectural model here. One of the things we're thinking about a lot in this exhibition is about how and where the prison system is visible or erased from view. And an artist who's thinking very explicitly about that is Ashley Hunt in this installation, Degrees of Visibility. Uh, this is a series of 270 images at this point that Ashley has taken um, across all 50 United States of detention centers, jails, and penitentiaries. And he always takes the images from a remote location. So you get the perspective of a passerby. In images such as this one, this is the Central California Women's Facility. It's actually the largest women's prison in the world. Uh, but you would have no idea looking at it. You, you can barely see anything in this image. And then other prisons, like this one here, the Old Wayne County Jail, actually blend into the urban landscape. So they sort of disappear from view, and in this way they become normalized, and we don't realize how much incarceration is part of the landscape all around us. Ashley's also really concerned with bringing into visibility the work of activists who are trying to resist or um, make changes to the prison system. And so as part of this exhibition, he collaborated with members of the Underground Scholars. That's a group of students across the UCs who were formerly incarcerated. Working with some of the members of the Underground Scholars, he made a digital broadsheet called Abolish the University, and that is available for download at barringfreedom.org. Here, this is Bars by Hank Willis Thomas, and it's a work that the artist has made by stitching together various decommissioned black and white striped prison uniforms. They're stitched together into this, this quilt, which is um, uh, patterned with the bars of a cell. Um, and amongst other things, I think this work invites us to consider how the structures of the system, things like the uniforms and the architecture, uh, really disappear the individual. If you look closely at the piece, you can see that there are areas where the uniforms show the history of being worn. You can see that they were on someone's body and that over time the black and gray coloring has started to wear away. This installation of photographs is by the artist Dina Lawson and it's a series of snapshots of the artist's cousin, Jasmine, and Jasmine's partner, Eric, taken at the Mohawk Correctional Facility. And looking at the images one after another, you can watch their young family grow and change, and you can really see the, the warmth and the love within the family. But all of this is taking place kind of within the structure of a prison, which is intruding into the background. One of the things that's sort of out of sight in these images is all of the emotional labor, the, the time, the money, the traveling that goes into keeping up and maintaining these bonds and nurturing and growing this love uh, when sort of within this system that's really designed to isolate people and separate them from each other. This really luminous work is called Bam Seated Warrior, and it's 
part of a series by Sanford Biggers in which he takes wooden figurative sculptures from across the African continent. Um, he's dipped them in wax um, and then has them shot and then takes those resulting figures and casts them in bronze. So as you can see, this is um, missing a leg here and it has um, a broken arm. The work is really a memorial to the many African Americans who have been murdered by police in this country. And it connects that history to the long history of state violence and anti-blackness that really starts in the 1600s with the kidnapping of enslaved Africans. So this work kind of sutures those, those two histories together. Over here is Infinite Tabernacle, which actually shows videos of some of those wooden figurines being shot. And then he reverses the film so that you see them then coming back together.